Good morning. This is Connor with Incredible Edible Landscapes. And as promised, I am gonna do a little video walkthrough of this new installation. This is about a 4,000 square foot side yard in Wellington. And previously, before we started, this was all grass lawn. There's a few existing trees here. Our client actually had a few trees removed and stump ground, some invasives that were in here. Uh, but the existing trees we have to start with, there's a p large pine right there. There's a mango, Barbados cherry, which you'll see closer up as I walk. There's a nice oak right here and a loquat right there. And we kind of based our design around that. This area right here, this kind of straight row of trees is kind of modeled after the Syntropic Agroforestry model. Although we tried not to overwhelm our client with a super dense spacing and uh, just kind of went for a practical application and uh, intercropping between our large trees. And so that's the straight portion of it. And then the rest of this has kind of a freeform curve to it, as you'll see. And we had to really just design around the existing trees that were here, which was a pretty fun part. So there's kind of, you know, a couple different design concepts in here. We have this nice curvature to the landscape here. Yeah, which allows access through to the backyard, the pool cage, etc. And uh, there's a lot going on here. This this front portion, this front probably eight foot or so, is actually planted with uh, mostly natives and all flowering plants. It's going to kind of be a visual buffer here as this fills in. So we have two Simpson stoppers right here. One and two. We have Thryalis interplanted with Mexican sage and. Uh, Fakahatchi grass going along the edge here and going around the loquat. There's some society garlic, tick seed, blue porter weed, and you'll see a bunch of perennial peanuts scattered through here. We used 150 perennial peanuts on here as our main ground cover, and there's a couple of other ground covers also sprinkled in here. So, in this project, there are 42 different species. And uh, that kind of sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of repetition in here and things are laid out in more or less a pattern, especially on this side, so that the maintenance can be uh, consistent and replicated down the line. So the first thing you'll see is obviously we have the Fakahatchi grass as our border and that's gonna kind of help re uh, retain this, this mulch versus grass edge here. And so there are uh, this is the native Fakahatchee grass, and this is a clumping grass that we use mainly for its purpose as a biomass producer, meaning it's a chop and drop plant. So these uh, were trimmed when we put them in, and they're going to grow up to maybe shoulder height, and uh, they're going to grow relatively quickly. Every uh, maybe two to three months, they'll be good for a trim. So those are going to be producing a lot of uh, good carbon, nitrogen, um, and minerals so that can be all trimmed back periodically and put back into our system and uh, that's going to be one of the first uh, you know quickest producers of biomass and mulch for this project as well as kind of just giving it that clean edge all the way down and just kind of separating this lawn area from the food forest and so interior to that we have this next row which there's perennial peanuts kind of sprinkled throughout the whole thing and we also have uh, this plant, which is a uh, member of the Cuban oregano family. This is called Plectranthus caninus, and it is an edible uh, culinary herb, just like Cuban oregano, the one that most people are familiar with, but this one actually makes a fantastic ground cover. So it's a mint family plant. It's gonna spread through this whole area and cover the ground, become kind of a living mulch, just like the perennial peanut. We use the perennial peanut uh, because it is excellent turf alternative it's a good ground cover a kind of living mulch and it also has these pretty edible flowers and a great benefit is it's a nitrogen fixing plant so that's going to benefit this whole system by depositing nitrogen into the soil over time we also have some mexican sunflower here we didn't really create a, a dense hedgerow of it but you'll see one here and then one uh, maybe 20, 25 feet down the row there. And they're spaced periodically as also another source of biomass. It's a 
probably the number one chop and drop plant you can grow in Florida. They call it the comfrey of the south. People think of comfrey because there's a lot of information online, but it doesn't really thrive in our climate. And to be honest with you, Mexican sunflower is better. It produces more material in a faster time. It's prettier uh, and it makes wonderful cut flowers if you allow it to get to the flowering stage. And on the next kind of secondary row here, you'll see a mix of salvias and blanket flowers interplanted in between these turmerics. So there's a few different varieties of turmeric here. That is the Hawaiian red. And this is the blue turmeric and we have the Indira yellow also down the line, kind of just uh, assorted, staggered through. And then there's more perennial peanuts here. And then we get into our fruit tree row. So there are nine fruit trees in this row, I believe. And we had to kind of scooch the design back a little bit entirely because our client decided that in the future she might want to potentially put a fence going straight across from the front wall of the house over. So originally we were going to be about 15 feet more out and we pushed everything back, which made the trees kind of take a curve around the back, which I think actually worked out better here. It was just a slight change of the design and I think it, uh, it really made things come together a lot nicer. So on the fruit tree row, we have, starting at the front, we have longan. This is a Kohala longan. And we have jackfruit, macadamia nut, three different varieties of avocado, two mulberries, a star fruit, and there's several bananas scattered throughout here. There's three here, uh, two more in the middle, and two more in the back. And in between each fruit tree, you'll see uh, these are planted at about 14 feet apart. Right in between, we put either a yucca, also known as cassava, there's another one there, and or we put a moringa. So these are gonna be kind of the secondary species on this row that are gonna be, uh, you know, between these each fruit tree, these are gonna take a little bit of time to fill in, the macadamia nut and the avocado right there. Uh, there's a lot of open space, so what we do in this model is make use of all the available space. Um, you know, as time goes on, we're kind of using time and the growth rate of these plants to our advantage. So there's plenty of sun right there and space for a moringa. That's gonna produce a ton of yield and eventually, several years down the road, that avocado and that macadamia might end up uh, getting, taking up so much space that the moringa needs to be phased out and other moringas can be planted elsewhere. Same with the yucca, plenty of sunlight, plenty of space, but eventually that jackfruit and that macadamia will be, um, their canopies will be approaching each other and there might not be enough room for full sun for yucca anymore. But in the meantime, we are making use of what we have, which is sunlight and space. So the yucca is gonna be about a nine or 10 month crop cycle. And uh, if, if she chooses to just grow yucca in between these consistently, then there's a good three or four years worth of production uh, for something like yucca in between there. Now the next phase after that would be as these trees develop a canopy, and then there's a true understory here that could be phased out and included, uh, include more turmeric in there or more uh, leafy greens or other things that can kind of handle the shade. Uh, there could be gingers in there. There could be all different types of things that are not going to take up the space that a yucca will because that's going to become a, a size of a small tree in about you know, six to nine months. Um, but once these trees fill in, that space can be used for something else. And obviously we recommend uh, to all of our clients and anybody that grows uh, in this fashion that they prune their trees regularly in order to develop a healthy canopy and to keep the fruiting branches low and keep these things from getting out of control. And that's just gonna benefit the system overall because you can, you can grow an avocado like this, for example, and you can let it grow as big as this mango that uh, may not have been pruned regularly in the uh, I believe 11 or 12 years since it's been there uh, but this this avocado you know 10 12 years from now could be kept at a size that only takes up this you know maybe 12 to 14 foot maximum 
width here and that can be kept as a production tree meaning it doesn't go up to the sky it really just goes wide and stays compact and uh, all the fruit is where you can reach it so this is a ulala la avocado also known as super haas and this little guy's already got a couple of fruit hanging on it and we put three different ones here we put super haas winter mexican and I'm forgetting which one this is this is a Simmons avocado. So this is a way to extend your avocado season way longer than just with one tree. So Simmons is gonna be the early variety and Super Haas is going to be the about November, December, like mid season variety. And then winter Mexican would be um, somewhere like January through February. So there's gonna be uh, at least probably a six month avocado season here once these trees come into production. And along the interior here inside from the fruit trees, we have obviously more perennial peanut. In between each one, we've got either a pineapple on the right or a African tree basil on the left. And this is becoming one of our favorite pollinator plants. It's a very prolific basil variety. It's a perennial and uh, it's, a, it's a great culinary basil. It tastes just like the tender Genovese basil but you can allow it to flower and it doesn't affect the leaf quality and the bees and butterflies really love this plant. So excellent thing to have near your fruit trees. It's gonna bring in the beneficial insects and pollinators in here to help uh, mitigate any pest pressure and increase pollination. We also have a couple other perennial veggies like the Lago spinach or the Celosia argentia. That's a great saute green. And we have Roselle here, that's a Florida cranberry or Jamaican sorrel. That makes a really good high vitamin C, uh, delicious fruit punch type drink. And there's some sisu spinach on the ground as a ground cover. There's more of that African tree basil. Here we've got a Pakistani mulberry. And down here is a Thai dwarf mulberry. And there's just a repetition here of turmeric, perennial peanut, uh, blanket flower, also known as gallardia. There's that Cuban oregano species we talked about. There's a native salvia there, another salvia, and here's another blanket flower that's starting to bloom. And uh, more Fakahatchee grass bordering the back here. Our client has actually a lot more land than is, is possible to use right now. There's a kind of an overgrown uh, set of invasive species back here. There's your typical cabbage palms and pines, and they're definitely being overtaken by various vines, uh, Brazilian pepper and strangler figs. So one of the next phases of this project that she's gonna plan out is to remove the invasive species back here, reclaim that back maybe half acre of land and there's a lot of potential for expansion here, uh, possibly not with uh, more food forest, but more of a different style of garden. Um, you know, she wants to create a, a cool space for uh, future grandkids to hang out and you know build a swing set and build kind of a, a cool little, uh, maybe botanical garden style setup back here. So that's something to look forward to. We've got a carambola right here, a star fruit tree with a cluster of fruit on it already. And it may drop some of those because it was just recently planted. In fact, there's a dropped fruit there. Um, so the, the new planting, it can kind of give a little bit of transplant shock to these trees. And normally they, they don't get uh, any kind of issues with it. But if they're hanging fruit, uh, the tree will kind of decide that it's, it would rather put the energy that's going into that fruit into just new root growth and getting established. So that's what we want. We want roots to be growing for the first year at least. Before we really focus on fruit production and let's see what variety is this that is a carry carambola that's pretty much the most tasty one um, it's not the largest carambola but it is a deep orange very sweet fruit and back here we've got a blue java banana and there's some more lago spinach more perennial peanuts we've got a couple of toilet paper plants here there's three of them and this is a a really fun one, has a nice texture. It smells like clean laundry. And in a pinch, uh, if we, if uh, toilet paper stops appearing on the shelves again, 
then uh, these leaves will get much bigger and they can actually be used as toilet paper. Off-grid PP production. And there's a beauty berry here at the end. Camera cut off there for a second, but that is the gist of this outer row, which is this kind of pattern of fruit trees at 14 foot spacing, interplanted with various support species and perennial vegetables. And then the interior part here, we had a design around these larger trees. So there's a Glen mango right there uh, that's having a pretty good year this year. The client says she's got 20 fruit ripening on her counter. And here we put a dwarf Namwa banana surrounded by a thryalis, blue porter weed, more perennial peanut. There's a chaya right there. That's the uh, Mexican tree spinach. We put a white butterfly ginger back here in the shade. That's a awesome fragrant flowering ginger. It smells like gardenia. And there's some Okinawa spinach here that's gonna fill in as a ground cover. We've got more, more porterweed. There's some calendula in there, more thryalis. Here's a papaya. And there's some cat whiskers in here. Let me show you the flowers on these guys. Very cool flowers. And throughout here, we've scattered in a bunch of the uh, salad tree, also known as edible leaf hibiscus. This is Abelmoshus manahat, and this makes a really good salad green. It's the most tender of all the perennial leafy greens that we grow so far, and it is a very nice buttery, light texture. It makes a great base for a salad. That can be eaten raw or cooked. Underneath the shade of the mango tree, we scattered some more perennial peanuts under here. And there's a couple more of the African tree basil here. Here's a papaya, another salad tree, and here's a dwarf green banana. And over here is, let's see which banana is this. That's a cocoa po banana. And in this kind of walkway area, we bordered each side with a pattern of society garlic and salvias, various different color salvias. More perennial peanut, another papaya, another salad tree, there's a chaya right there, Mexican sage, and tick seed. This is becoming one of our favorite native wildflowers to use. They absolutely thrive here. They grow with no attention and they will populate an area by seeding themselves all over the ground after those flowers bloom. They set seed and these should start to fill in all the gaps in this area, which is kind of the goal here. We put all the native wildflowers on the edges in hopes that they would fill in and kind of populate here and just naturalize. There's another roselle. There's one of our irrigation risers. So we did micro irrigation on this whole area and I might get you a shot of that running before I go. So these are 180 degree micro sprayers and they're all, they're on either side of the path here. Those are gonna spray into the bed and not on the pathway. So our client can potentially walk through here in the morning as the irrigation is going on and not get wet. And those are just delivering the exact amount of water that we need to the plants that they're on. Our, our line in the back there with all the fruit trees has a drip irrigation on it. So each tree and each uh, yucca and moringa in between are just getting a drip um, every morning. And, but the majority of the species that we use here are very drought tolerant. So the perennial peanut, the tree basils, um, the turmeric, and most of this other stuff is not gonna need supplemental irrigation. Uh, we get plenty of rainfall here, especially this time of year, but also just the addition of uh, a couple inches of compost and four to six inches of mulch in this area is gonna really hold that moisture in. And that's gonna really eliminate the need for supplemental irrigation. Uh, but since the fruit trees are the biggest investment here, uh, we do have drip irrigation, which uh, it's actually underneath here. Here's our drip line and here's the emitter. That's actually a bubbler. Um, so that is gonna go on every morning and these can be buried. It's just gonna trickle out water here. It's gonna seep through the ground and irrigate our trees. And so very minimal irrigation system. This was replacing an existing lawn sprinkler system. So each 
what we refer to as zones would be everywhere where there was a lawn sprinkler that we uh, put an adapter on, rise it up and put our uh, drip irrigation tube on there. So uh, kind of retrofitting on top of the existing system. It's the way we like to do it. There's Society Garlic Sage, perennial peanut here. This is a large Barbados cherry that the client had already here. And let's see if we can get some flower action on this. Pretty sure it's blooming on this side. There's one of the Barbados cherry flowers. And as you can see, this tree um, kind of has some lichen covering it, some algae. That to me is an indication that this tree has not been growing very rapidly lately uh, because the, the lichen has a chance to grow on that bark. The bark's not expanding, the tree's not growing fast. So to me, that means that it needs a little bit of TLC and generally just removing the grass, adding the compost, adding the mulch, and especially adding the perennial peanut here is gonna really help. And this tree is going to really start to be happier now. It's gonna grow a lot more consistently. It'll probably be flowering a lot more and fruiting a lot more. And that's what we'd like to see. Here's some more cat whiskers. We've got some katook in here. It's one of my favorite perennial vegetables. Very high protein, leafy green. I believe it has about half of its weight is uh, protein. There's some Cuban buttercup. It's a nice, beautiful yellow flower that we use for beneficial insect attraction. There's more Mexican sage, more cat whiskers, another Turk's cap hibiscus. And over on this side, we have one of my favorite flowering trees, which is the Vitex. Here's some of the flowers. This tree just smells great, not only the flowers, but actually the foliage smells really good. It kind of smells like uh, just clean laundry. It was a, it's a great uh, kind of perfumey, light smell. And then we've got some more salvias, more society garlic, more buttercup there. There's a papaya, there's another one of those salad trees or tender leaf hibiscus. Put some medicinal calendula in here. This is a high resin variety, which can be used for different herbal applications that are good for the skin. Some perennial peanut. Another kind of interplanting of katuk, Turk's cap, katuk, Turk's cap, and some more tick seed. And uh, we added a couple of gingers here underneath the canopy of the existing oak tree. And over here we got some more papayas or bananas. That's a dwarf Cavendish. There's a double Mahoy and a dwarf Brazilian here. Gold nugget jackfruit, nice crafted jackfruit variety. And we got rained out on this job four out of five days that we were working here. So this was a five day project. To be honest, we could have probably gotten it done in four days or even three and a half, but every day our work time got cut short by the uh, monsoons that were coming down but uh, we'll take it as a benefit for all these newly planted trees we didn't really see any wilting after we planted here because uh, the ground was just saturated and uh, good rainfall here this site drains pretty well so we didn't have to worry about any kind of flooding issues Just a beautiful project. Really love the way it came out here. Here's one of the Turk's cap flowers. We have a uh, sweet almond tree in here. One of the best for attracting pollinators and beneficial insects, and also just the smell. It's gotta have one of the best smells of any of the plants in here. It just smells like a sweet perfume. And here's some 
molokia, also known as Egyptian spinach. It's a good perennial leafy green, edible raw or cooked. And I think that does it as far as the plant species that are planted in here. Here's a little bit of the micro irrigation action, kind of a low profile system that just puts the water where it's needed, when it's needed. And I believe our drip line for the trees is on a different irrigation zone. So that may not be running right now. But uh, pretty cool system here. Allows you to be out in the garden while it's getting watered. And like I said, most of these things don't need supplemental irrigation, but the bananas will really appreciate it. And overall, it's just gonna help this system get established much sooner, which is uh, kind of the goal when you wanna minimize your maintenance, especially for our clients that maybe not have all the time of the day to be out here. I really just advised her to come out once a day and just take a walk through, whether it be morning or evening, and just kind of observe things. That's the homework assignment that I give to all of our clients when we're done installing is that you just go out every day and take a look at what's growing, take a look at uh, what plants have new growth, what's blooming, uh, whether something is uh, maybe growing, you uh, know, flopping over, maybe needs a trim or, you know, any, any otherwise just other ob observations and uh, take a look at what pollinators are out here, you know, what kind of insects do you see out here? Are they benefiting? Um, do you see a balance going on and just, you know, monitoring whether things are growing or not. Um, you know, maybe there's about 500 plants here and maybe a couple of them might not uh, end up taking off. Maybe they're planted in the wrong spot. Um, maybe it's just the wrong uh, plant for this particular slice of land. These are things that we can take our best guess at when we're evaluating for one of these projects. But, uh, you know, we, we don't... Uh, spend years on the site and you always really can't just predict you know what's going to thrive and what's going to be marginal and what might not take off but we can really make an educated guess uh, particularly just because the set of species that we grow in our nursery are all things that are Florida friendly they're adapted to our climate they're known to do well in most situations here and those are the things that we kind of stick with and then we might try one or two things here and there that uh, may be, you know, uh, marginal, or you may not know 100% that you're gonna get good results out of them. Uh, but the majority of things here, you know, the bananas, the papayas, the avocados, uh, we know for sure that those are gonna do well. The bacahatchee grass, the, uh, the yucca, the turmeric, you know, pineapples, perennial peanut, all this stuff is known to thrive. So, you know, 95% of the things that we plant here, I would say in, uh, in uh, three or six months when we come back to do a checkup visit on this, they're all gonna have filled in beautifully. And uh, this system is really gonna start filling in. It's gonna look beautiful. People ask all the time, what does a project like this cost? And you know, really there are so many moving parts here that uh, it, it doesn't really do justice for me to just give you a straight answer. And I, I can definitely give you a range, um, you know, but the, the amount of things that uh, different clients might ask for in their project, um, for here, we just did mulch, mulch pathways. But if we did something like we do on our, uh, on some other jobs where we do uh, like a hardscape pathway, some sort of aggregate, whether it's shell or granite or river rock, um, that can add a substantial amount to the project. Um, you know, different plants have different costs. Some things are harder to get a hold of, so you might end up spending more money on your plant budget. Um, this site, a huge cost factor is the existing condition of the site. So this was all just grass. All we had to do was come in here with the sod cutters and the machine and, and just remove all the grass, which is pretty much standard. We do that on almost every job. However, um, you know, if there's other things, like our client had some larger trees here that she got taken out, she got them stump ground, so we didn't have to do that. Um, but, you know, depending on what your site looks like, 
that might be a huge cost factor as far as uh, how do we get this site ready to plant a food forest. So we've done projects in areas with low elevation and we had to raise up the ground by, you know, a, a foot almost or, or even two feet. Um, some areas in the inland communities just have poor drainage and you might have a great spot on your yard, but it holds water in the rainy season and we can't plant fruit trees in an area that stays flooded for one or two weeks after a hurricane because you're just going to lose your investment. So if that's the case, you know, we have to bring in uh, material to raise the land up to make it suitable for planting and that can cost a lot more. Um, you know, obviously different factors like that can really influence the cost of a job like this. Um, but, you know, that being said, we try to make things uh, as as budgetable as possible with our clients. We're very open about where their expenses are going for these and uh, you know and when are whenever there are any variables that can be changed in order to put the budget where you want it that's obviously you know a conversation that we always like to have because we want to make sure that uh, our clients are getting the best bang for their buck best value possible out of an installation like this and uh, we want to make sure that they're only getting the plants that they really want um, you know all these different factors come into play so you know if you're interested in having something like this done if you have a space that you really have visions for and you want to make that come to life you can definitely get in touch with us and we can do a consultation and kind of figure out what needs to be done there to make it turn into your dream and uh, that's something that we just love to do we love to make these uh, what I call it is a a lawn is a liability because you know you're expending resources you're expending money you know you're paying for that land even that you're not getting anything out of other than just a green lawn um, so you know so that's a liability it's costing you money you're not getting anything from it and this is an asset this is something that produces food for you uh, it produces beauty this increases property value and uh, it also just in terms of your quality of life you know, what do you spend your time doing? Um, you know, that that one or two hours a day, you might just be uh, watching Netflix or watching TV and, uh, you know, getting stressed out. You could be out here spending time in your garden. This is, this is good for the soul, you know, being out here just observing with your five senses. Um, I heard recently, it was said that uh, the best benefit out of a garden is that it, it just gives you back your five senses. You know, we spend a lot of time inside. We spend a lot of time working, you know, sitting on our butts, uh, not doing much to be in the way of being productive and being out here, you know, using your eyes, your ears, your nose, and, you know, touching, you know, getting your hands in the dirt and just playing around in this. Even if it's just, you know, you, your client might get a fruit off this papaya next year, take that fruit, scoop the seeds out and just come and scatter them around. And uh, that might be 100 seeds, you might get 20 sprouts, and maybe two of them are, are in a good spot where you want to let them grow. But, you know, having that hands-on experience, um, or particularly if you have kids and you let them run through here, and hey, uh, you know, pick some mulberries and yeah, eat a leaf off of a roselle and watch the butterflies come on the gallardia. You know, all of this is increasing your quality of life. So. People uh, tend to not think about that when they're factoring the cost of these things, but in reality, you know, spending time in a garden is so good for you and it can impact all other areas of life just by, you know, changing, uh, you know, the way you spend your time and your disposition on a daily basis. I think if you just took a 20 minute walk through this garden every morning, you know, 7 a.m. when the sun's starting to come up, it's still cool out, and then you go about your day, um, you know, you might really see a positive change. So that's something really to consider in this. It's almost unquantifiable. But uh, you know, anyway, there's my rant. This is this project and we're super stoked on this one. It's actually only it's a few miles from the nursery. So we'll be coming back here to do checkups and make sure everything goes smoothly on this project. So anyway, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate all the support, guys. This has been a fun one.